Hey guys, today we're taking another look at the Sharp X68000. We already know that it's a graphics and sound powerhouse, but that's not to say that it can't be improved. So let's take a look at a few strategic upgrades right now, here on Retro Bits. The X68000 was introduced in 1987, and I've previously talked about the history and specs of the system in a number of past episodes. 1987 was also the year that the Roland MT32 MIDI synthesizer came to market, finding a niche among high-end computer and gaming enthusiasts. Roland's SC55, with general MIDI and wavetable support, would come out four years later in 1991, the same year my X68000 Super was manufactured. These MIDI devices represented the highest end of music reproduction available for personal computers at the time. Therefore, it's no surprise that they were well supported by the X68K, itself at the forefront of home computer technology. With one of the handful of optional MIDI add-on cards, many of the system's game titles fully supported the MT32 and SC55. In the present day, finding an original MIDI card is expensive. Figure up to two or $300 plus shipping from Japan for an untested unit. Fortunately, there are modern solutions available, such as the open-sourced Midiori project shown here. The version 2 device is scaled back from the original and only has a MIDI outport, doing away with the in and through ports and extra features in favor of a cost-reduced design that uses less expensive and easier to source components. Similar to ISA cards on a PC, X68K expansions also have base address and IRQ settings, but the values are fixed on the Midiori. The good news is that these cards are readily available on both eBay and Tindy. I've wanted to add a MIDI card since I first acquired the X, but I've held off due to the cost. The price here is reasonable considering the parts and time it takes to build, test, and ship, but I'm also notoriously thrifty. Well, in this case, patience paid off because I recently ran into a forum member who had built a batch of cards for himself and was selling the extras at cost, only $60. Now that is a no-brainer, so I jumped on the opportunity immediately. In addition to a MIDI card, I've also been after a RAM upgrade for quite some time. Prices for original boards are also in the $200 to $300 range, so it's great that there's another open source project called the Gal's Panic. I'm not sure why it's so named. There's a Gal or generic array logic chip on the board, but Panic? There was an arcade game of the same name that had a spin off on the PC98, but not the X. Anyway, why the extra RAM? A good number of games required more than the base 2 megabytes my system came with in order to be run from the hard disk. The reason is that floppy drive emulation has been used to trick the software that was never designed to run from a hard drive in the first place. The drawback? This needs additional memory beyond the game's original requirements. As with the Midiori, prices for a fully assembled card are reasonable given the niche market, but not exactly in what I would call impulse buy territory. The seller from whom I purchased the Midiori also had one of these 6 megabyte cards available also for only $60. With this, I should be able to play all of the software titles that have been converted for hard disk use that I couldn't run before. One drawback to the stylish twin tower design is that there is only room for two expansion slots, unlike a generic beige box that commonly had 7 or 8. Sharp did sell a version with a desktop form factor that had four slots, known as the X68000 Pro. Before I remove the slot covers, let me ask you a question. Have you ever rounded off a Phillips head screw even though you thought you had the right size screwdriver? Well, if it's from Japan, that's probably because it's not a Phillips head. The JIS, or Japanese Industrial Standard, looks the same but the shape and the angle of the slots are slightly different. Using a Phillips driver on a JIS screw is an easy way to round out the head. You can often identify a JIS screw by the small dot that's imprinted on the head. It's generally safe to use a JIS screwdriver on a Phillips screw, but not vice versa. So if you're working on Japanese equipment and you want to be safe, 
Get yourself a set of JIS drivers. With the two slot covers removed, we can now see inside the expansion port, and there's only a couple things of interest here. The first is the slot alignment guide, which is at the top and the bottom of the machine, and allows the cards to align perfectly with the card slots inside the machine. And if we take a closer look inside, we can see the two 100-pin card slots that are part of the I.O. backplane. Installing the cards is really just a matter of aligning them in the slot, and then pressing them into the backplane. The Midiori card was built according to the specifications on the GitHub site, which calls for a 1.6 millimeter edge connector, but that's really a lot tighter than the smaller edge connector used on the RAM expansion, so you have to give it a pretty good amount of force to get it to seat into the machine. And there we go. The Midiori card comes with its own 3D printed slot cover that has a hole for the mini DIN connector here, so we'll just install it like this. And then for the RAM expansion, we'll use the factory slot cover to cover it back up. So I did find that the slot cover for the Midiori isn't a perfect fit. The screw holes are slightly too close together, causing it to bulge out a bit here. So what I think I need to do is just slot one of these screw holes to relieve some of that tension, and then it should fit a little bit better. And with a quick trip out to the garage, it's now sitting nice and flush. As I mentioned, the Midiori uses a mini DIN connector instead of the standard full-size DIN used by most MIDI devices. What's more, it's only five pins, so you can't use the standard PS2 style keyboard connector, you need a custom cable. Adapters do exist, and they are available out there, though they are few and far between. I was able to find this one on Tindy, and it did take two or three weeks to get to me from Mexico, but it should do the job, and they aren't very expensive if you need one yourself. So I'll just take that, and then I will connect the full-size MIDI cable to the adapter, just like that. Now, some games support the MT32, and some games support General MIDI with devices like the SC55 here, and some games support both. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the MIDI out from the computer and plug it into the MIDI in of the SC55, then I'm going to take the MIDI through from the SC55 and plug it into the MIDI in of the MT32. That way we can use both devices without having to change any wiring. You may remember from past episodes that the X68000 has a video input as well as an audio input. Now, this is mostly for genlocking, overlaying computer graphics on top of an external source. The audio input passes the source into the digital PCM chip of the system and allows you to digitize samples. It is not, unfortunately, used for passing through audio from an external source or mixing it with the computer's internal sound and then passing it out the output. Still really cool, though, that this computer had the ability to digitize audio right out of the box all the way back in 1987. What that means is we're going to need a mixer to combine the computer sound with the external MIDI synth. And as luck would have it, I found this mixer for sale for just $1 at a recent ham fest. So let's give it a try and see how it works. And the last piece of the puzzle is we need to configure the machine to see the additional RAM. And we'll do that with the switch command, which is like entering the BIOS of your PC. We'll go down here to memory, and we'll just change that all the way up to eight megabytes. And go to the save, and there we go. Now we're ready to test, and for that, we're going to need some software. So I've been on Yahoo Auctions Japan again, and this is the result. And before we open up and take a look at the software, I thought we would take a look at the boxes themselves. Just like PC big box games of the era, there are a variety of different sizes and shapes, and I thought it was interesting that there's no standardization, given that this system is somewhat niche and only sold in a single market. But there you go, we have a bunch of different size boxes, starting with this one, which is you know the narrowest and the shortest. 
This one here has the same exact depth and height, but it's wider, so different size altogether. One thing that's different about this title compared to the rest is everyone else here has a clamshell case, a hard shell plastic case like a VHS tape, but this one has a cardboard sleeve around its plastic case on the inside. And then we've got these two, which are from different manufacturers, but have the same exact case, same, every dimension is the same, and they have the same kind of sticker on the top even. So, I don't know, there's some kind of standardization here. This one is basically the same height as the other two, but it is much wider than these guys here. So, we have a good variety of sizes, shapes, and construction across even this small number of games. Another interesting thing here is that all of the spines kind of contain the same standardized information. They all say that they're for the X68000 or 68030 machines. They all say what kind of disc are inside, 5 inch 2 HD. So that's an interesting notation for 5 and a quarter inch. 5 inch 2 HD, FD4. There's four floppies on this one, 5 inch 2 HD. This one has six floppies, so it tells you how many discs are on there, what size the discs are, it tells you the manufacturer of the game, or the publisher, and it also tells you how much the game cost. And 88,000 yen back in 1990 would have been about 143 US dollars adjusted for inflation, so these are not budget titles. One thing you'll find as a prospective or new X68000 owner is that the cost of original software on eBay is prohibitive. Unless you're heir to the Rockefeller fortune or a serious, and I mean serious, collector, you're probably going to want to give these auctions a pass. Fear not, though, for all is not lost. Once again, Yahoo Auctions Japan comes to the rescue, and I scored this box version of Fatal Fury for just under $10 plus shipping. You have to be patient and persistent, but deals are absolutely still out there to be had. And here it is. Fatal Fury, or Garo Densetsu, the Legend of the Hungry Wolf, as it was originally called. This is the first of three SNK titles in the series from the Neo Geo that was ported over to the X68000. And as we can see here, it was copyright 1993 from Home Data by the Magical Company, and we've got the 1991 trademark from SNK there. Flipping it over onto the back, we can see there's a bunch of game art here, and if we zoom in, here we can see a notification about co-op multiplayer, and there's a notification here that says you need four megabytes of RAM for the co-op multiplayer mode. In addition, we can see that the MT32 and Sound Canvas SC55 are supported by this game. All right, let's take a quick look at what's inside the box. And as I mentioned, this one has this cardboard sleeve around the inner box, so I'm just gonna pull that off and set it aside. And here we've got the inner box, which is a nice hard plastic case with the Magical and Home Data logos on it. Let me just open that up. And we've got some foam. And the discs are contained in their own hard plastic case with the Magical Company logo on them. Oh, and Home Data is embossed on the disc. So this isn't even just a generic disc case. This is actually made specifically for this. So again, an expensive product, but you get some premium features like a hard embossed disc case. Inside, we've got one, two, three, four discs, and they're labeled A, B, C, and D. And each one of these discs has a unique piece of artwork on it, which is pretty cool. So that's nice, but we will be doing a bunch of disc flipping unless we play this game from the hard drive. What else we got in here? Okay, this is the user's manual, very clearly labeled. And it's full color, that's nice. We've got some artwork in here. It's all in Japanese, of course. We've got some game screenshots in full color, which is nice. And you know, all the joystick commands and special moves. Maybe not all the special moves, but who knows? Maybe the, the first couple for each character, perhaps. And there's all the characters. Again, storyline. Very cool. Nice manual, full color. What we've got here is a notification to the end user that the home data company has changed their name to Mahoko, or the magical company. I'm not sure why they felt it was necessary to include this kind of notification inside the game box, but there you have it. Company changed its name. Here we've got the uh, warranty and registration card. 
Not filled out yet, probably no point in doing it now, but that's pretty cool, nice little artifact. And then finally, this is an addendum to the user manual, and it contains things like additional game modes. There's a versus mode and a two-player co-op mode. It also talks about uh, three-button joystick support, as well as uh, new keyboard support for some of the special moves. So yeah, just an addendum to the user manual. Many games for the X span multiple disks, so it's standard operating procedure to load both drives up before powering on the machine. I really love the dancing light show on the floppy drives as the game bounces back and forth between the two. Almost every title I've seen so far has some kind of loading music or animation, which is a nice touch since we'll be waiting around a lot. All right, let's see if the MIDI card is working properly and compare the available audio options. First up, have a listen to the game's title screen music using the system's onboard FM and PCM sound chips. Now, let's hear the same intro music, this time on the MT32. Awesome! The Midiori card is working perfectly right out of the box. No need to fiddle with drivers or anything, at least not yet. Now, the SC55. This game spans four discs, so there's a lot of swapping. The servo eject is a nice touch on these five and a quarter inch drives. I think it's neat how the game blends the MIDI music with onboard sound, such as the chanting here. It's kind of an odd design choice to task the single PCM channel with game sounds and the vocal track, though. So far so good, this is a pretty solid port. Later titles in the series are even more impressive on the X, if you can believe that. Next up is Overtake, and I paid just under $10 for this title as well, and it's one of the very few first-person racing games for the system. Now, I like racing games, but unfortunately, the X68000 is not a great system for racing games in general. 
One neat thing about this one though is up here we see that there's a FIA Formula One World Championship logo here. So apparently this is an officially licensed product and we can see that the cars and teams look to be official cars as well here on the front. On the side, we can see this one is 9,800 yen. So this one was even more expensive than some of the other games that we looked at. And on the back, there's a ton of information. Let me get you zoomed in here. So there's a lot of information about the game right here. And the first thing that they want to point out is that this is an officially licensed product and that it has all of the original drivers, manufacturers, cars, and racetracks from the 1992 season. Then they go on to tell you that they've actually used uh, PCM importing of the exhaust sounds from the various cars. So they've digitized the sound of the different cars for this game. And they've equipped the game with RS-232 serial communication so you can play multiplayer with your friends using a null modem cable, which is pretty cool if you have two X68000s and two copies of this almost $200 game. Sure, why not? And then they mentioned the MIDI support. It has support for both the MT32 as well as the SC55. And then they say that using an analog joystick promises even more realistic operability, which is absolutely true. We're gonna find that using a digital control pad on this racing game is really not ideal. And then down here at the bottom, they also mention again, the MIDI support here, the price, the number of discs, there's six discs in this box. So a lot of information on the box to help you make your decision when you're spending this much money. Let's take a quick look at the inside of the box. Again, this is a nice hard plastic clamshell case. Open it up here. And we've got the user manual. Again, user manual's in English, but the rest of it is not. And uh, we've got pretty thick manual. It's nice hard stock paper, and it's pretty thick. It goes over all the configuration options and how to set up the game. So yeah, pretty good manual there. And then in the back, we've got a cartoon the history of the Zoom Racing Organization. And we've got a fully illustrated cartoon here. It contains the uh, Zoom mascot as part of the storyline. Fully illustrated, that's pretty cool. I've noticed that a lot of these games have kind of features like this. They all seem to have a little backstory or a cartoon or something in the manual, which is, you know, it's a neat extra. We've got the uh, warranty and registration card here, same as before. And we've got the game discs. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six discs, just like we saw on the cover, opening one and two. So there are two discs dedicated just to the opening animation. That's pretty cool. And then we've got system disc and three data discs. And they've got this lovely silver label, which is really nice, um, instead of the individual artwork. But yeah, this is a, a really nice disc label but we're gonna be flipping discs an awful lot with this game unless we install it to the hard drive, which I believe you can do with this game. The game's intro is over six minutes in length, so no surprise it takes up two full discs. It's chock full of artwork, digital audio samples, and animations, but I wonder if they saved any development time for the game itself. Here's a quick sample before we find out. The game can be installed to the hard drive, but it still needs to be launched from floppy. I guess for copy protection purposes. I went ahead and installed it so we can avoid all that disk swapping malarkey. The game also features a collection of info about each of the teams, drivers, and cars. Getting their money's worth from the licensing deal at least.
Art and Senna won the driver's title in 91, but not in 92. His tragic accident wouldn't be for another two years after the game's release. If you were a diehard F1 fan, you'd probably get a kick out of all this, but me? I just want to play the game. So, moving on. Here's a fun little thing. When you select the SC55 in the configuration screen, a little animation plays on the display while program data is sent to the device. Neat! The graphics are good, but something bothers me about the way the road curves off the side of the screen. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's almost like a problem with the FOV. There's some slight elevation changes if you look closely, but this particular track is pretty flat. Coincidentally, that's also how I'd describe the gameplay. It's not really a simulation, but neither is it an arcade racer. Maybe it'd be better if I wasn't using a D-pad. On the whole, Overtake is a polished looking product with decent realism for its time, along with lots of extras for the hardcore F1 nerds. Where it falls short is in the gameplay department. I'd wish they'd put more time into the driving experience and less on the snazzy packaging and two-disc intro. Alright, enough whinging. Let's move on and have a look at an arcade racer that does things right. Next up, we have Super Hang On, which is a kind of quintessential piece of software for the X68000 because it's really one of the best racers on the system. And so I may have gotten a little bit carried away and I spent $30 on this game, but you know what, given that it lists for over $300 on eBay, I still feel like I got a good deal on it. On the back here, we have some nice full color artwork from the game and some promotional marketing literature to help sell it. So right here, it's telling us that this is an amazing game with 24 courses and no identical scenes, a brilliant scene that will draw you into the screen, and an up-down course that increases the sense of reality. And then they go on to say that Super Hang On has a variety of courses, including Africa, Asia, America, and Europe. And we can see here that it supports the CyberStick, which is the two-handed analog controller for the system and that would really help for a, a racing game like this. And it also has MIDI support for the MT32, but not general MIDI, so the SC55 is not supported. The SC55 has an MT32 emulation mode, but it's not very good. All right, let's take a quick look inside. Again, we've got the nice plastic clamshell case. This one's got a pretty thin manual. It's only a couple pages long and kind of covers the basics of the gameplay, but there's not much to it there. Kind of a no-frills manual. And then we've got uh, the discs in a plastic sleeve. And there's only two of them this time. And kind of, yeah, just regular old discs. No frills here. You're still paying the full 8,800 yen price, the premium price for this game, but you're not getting much in the way of extras with Super Hang On. What is it about these racing games where every one of the opponents gets a hole shot and leaves the player in the dust?
Now this is more like it. The gameplay feels fast and responsive and I can actually see where the road is going. The MT-32 also sounds fantastic here. It's really mellow compared to the hard edges of the SC-55's patches with its overused distorted guitar sounds. A simple but polished experience, Super Hang On is arcade racing done right. Despite not having hardware sprite scaling, the graphics are excellent and the gameplay is smooth. It's a shame the X68000's Outrun conversion was never completed. I bet it would have been epic. So far so good then with the X68000 upgrades. I have so many more interesting things to show you, but this video is already running long, so I think we'll stop here for today and pick up with even cooler stuff in the next episode. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on part two. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.